Welcome to The Authority File. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. In this four-episode series brought to you by the Liberty Fund, I'll be speaking with Aurelian Kreshu, professor of political science at Indiana University Bloomington. He's also an adjunct professor in the American Studies Program and the Lilly Family School of Philanthropic Studies at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. We're here to talk about his latest book, which he edited and published with the Liberty Fund, a modern interpretation of Jacques Necker's 1792 work on executive power in great states. Necker, interestingly enough, was a Swiss statesman and banker appointed by King Louis XVI to be France's director of the Royal Treasury and later Director General of Finances. Necker's text is an examination of executive power and compares the French political system with those of America and England, offering a robust defense of representative government. Necker's thesis was somewhat novel at the time, arriving well before other more prominent political thinkers, such as Tocqueville, turned their sights on America's political landscape. Even so, Necker never managed to capture as much popular interest. This, perhaps, can be attributed to his moderate political views. Moderates, the thinking goes, don't stick out as much as their more radically leaning colleagues. Nevertheless, the book and Necker's ideas resonate in the context of today's contentious political environment. In this third episode, Dr. Kreshu and I dive a little more deeply into this edition of Necker's On Executive Power in Great States, particularly Necker's main takeaways from his comparative constitutional analysis between France, England, and America. So, of course, the the reason we're talking about uh, Necker is the new edition of On Executive Power in Great States that Liberty Fund just brought out. So um, how does how does the book fit into Necker's overall oeuvre? This is a very important book uh, uh, for Necker. Um, First of all, it's the book in which he brings his political experience to bear uh, on his personal, uh, let's say, trajectory and his philosophical conception of, uh, let's say, constitutional monarchy and moderation. So mm-hmm. here you have the Necker, the politician, uh, meeting or joining Necker, the philosopher. Um, and I think this combination makes the book unique in this regard. This was also a very influential book when it appeared. Uh, it was immediately translated into French and German, and um, um, excuse me, it was immediately translated into German and English, and we used uh, the English uh, 1792 translation and revised it thoroughly. Um, but the fact that the book was translated immediately into English shows that uh, it was perceived as a very important statement. Necker mm. uh, had left the political scene by then. The book was written in uh, the early 1792. It was published in April of 1792. Necker had left the French pol- political scene in September of 1790. So he had some time, um, let's say, to to reflect um, away from the sound and fury of politics on what what went wrong and what could still be uh, achieved. Um, And let's not forget that the revolution is still very much uh, alive. Uh, The king is still on the throne of France when he writes the book. So he has a series of hopes uh, for, for the kingdom of France. And he shows a certain path that the French ought to have followed, but in the end, they did not. So in a way, it's a, it's a book that is both a reflection on the past, but also a projection of his hopes and uh, a path to follow for the future. And in this regard, it's a unique book because it's it combines personal recollections with uh, philosophical reflections, political considerations, but also kind of a political agenda for the country. It's a historical book, but it's also a forward-looking book. And in this regard, it's a, a remarkable. Also, I should point out that the topic, executive power, is um, is a topic that uh, had not been studied uh, before. Uh, the topic of executive power had been a, approached by Publius in the Federalist Papers uh, about the same time, actually, in this uh, across the ocean in the United States. But um, among political theorists and uh, political writers of the time, the concept of executive power uh, remained somewhat... Um, clouded in, in a sort of mystery. Um, the legislative power uh, was seen as the most important one. Uh, 
by many um, thinkers. And for Necker, it is the executive power that is the most, let's say, difficult power to fix in a modern uh, country. Um, and he says this at the beginning of the book in uh, some of the opening chapters. Uh, it's not that difficult to figure out how to organize the legislative power, uh, but uh, the key in, in organizing a modern state is uh, how to fix, how to organize the executive power, because the executive power has to be subordinated to the legislative power, but at the same time, uh, it, it, it gives the impetus to the community, to the commonwealth. The, it, it makes decisions in times of emergencies, so it has a lot of authority. That authority has to be strong enough, but at the same time circumscribed, limited. And in this regard, Necker parts company with the predecessors. For Locke, John Locke, in the second treatise on government, the legislative power is the, uh, he calls it the soul of the commonwealth. For Necker, it is uh, the executive power. So it's a very in innovative approach that he takes in this in this book, and uh, one that uh, I think has a lot of resonance for us today. Okay, so a good portion of of Necker's book um, is also devoted to critiques of the French Constitution of, of 1791. Um, can you describe the main thrust of the Constitution and and what Necker thought was was particularly wrong with it? Indeed, the book itself uh, offers a, a kind of detailed analysis of the, of the French Constitution of 1791. It's a constitution that was the outcome of almost two years of um, almost two years um, of uh, debates in the National Constituent Assembly. Mm. Um, so one could not say that the French were um, um, in a hurry to pass a new constitution, but um, uh, they took a long, a long time in this regard, but uh, Necker understood very clearly that uh, even if this was the outcome of long deliberations, um, the deliberations <laughs> took a wrong exit, so to speak, and uh, uh, <laughs> the deliberation ended in failure for him. The yeah. constitution for him was um, an un imbalanced one uh, because it uh, was based on a fundamentally wrong premise for Necker. And the premise was that the executive power ought to be annihilated or ought to be humiliated or to be reduced to an ancillary power in the architecture, in the constitutional architecture of modern government. And Necker uh, thought that that was the fundamental flaw, the fundamental limit, shortcoming of the Constitution of 1791. It failed to acknowledge the importance of executive power. And there were reasons for that, and he understood very clearly what the reasons were. The reason was that uh, there was a huge distrust of the king that was perceived by the more radical members of the assembly as trying to um, subvert and maybe uh, block the initiatives of the representatives of the people. And the conduct of the king at times uh, gave some credence to this image and interpretation of the royal power. But uh, Necker thought that that was not uh, uh, how the legislators ought to have proceeded. They ought to have um, um, limited the um, arbitrary prerogatives of the king, but also they ought to have given the king enough authority and power to exercise their role as the rep his role as the representative of the nation. Both the legislators and the king were to be seen as representative of the nation. So the the um, Constitution of 1791 uh, ended up creating uh, an imbalanced uh, constitution with a hugely influential legislative power and a very weakened executive power. The king was made the first basically functionary, the first bureaucrat of the nation, Necker says somewhere in the book. Wow. And the royal authority would have demanded something else from that. So it's this uh, um, strong separation of powers and the diminishing uh, of the executive power uh, that um, uh, was the main problem with the, with the Constitution. There were other limits of the Constitution that he analyzes, um, but this is at the heart of his critique. Okay, excellent. So he uses some interesting terms to to describe all of this and an, uh, an intertwining of powers or an interlacing. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about what he actually means by that and and, um, and and sort of how those terms reflect his views on executive power. 
Traditionally, um, the doctrine of the separation of power meant um, that uh, those who exercise the executive power um, ought to be different from those who exercise the legislative power and the judiciary power. Mm -hmm. The um, classical formulation of the separation of powers um, can be found in uh, Montesquieu's The Spirit of the Laws. There are roots of it in uh, Locke's second treatise. But even in uh, Montesquieu's uh, uh, text, it's pretty clear that uh, the separation cannot be uh, very um, absolute. Um, Montesquieu wrote about the blending of distributions of the powers uh, in a constitutional monarchy, and he was also an admirer of the English constitutional monarchy. So Necker follows in the footsteps of um, Montesquieu in this regard, and he understood that the strict separation of powers is... um, is not um, um, the solution to the problems uh, of France. The power uh, ought to be uh, both separated and blended. The three powers ought to be both separated and blended, which means that, uh, for example, um, the king uh, should also exercise some legislative functions. I distinguish here between the legislative power and the legislative functions. And in turn, the legislators... Uh, the representatives of, uh, of, of the people ought to be uh, exercising some uh, executive functions. And it is this mixing of the functions of the three powers, in this case two powers, uh, to be precise, executive and uh, legislative, that Necker um, illustrates with his terms uh, intertwining, interlacing of powers. I preferred uh, the translation as intertwining of powers, it can be used also as interlacing of powers. The French original term is entrelacement de pouvoir. So Necker thought that this is the key term, and he um, um, writes in the first chapter of the book, and I quote, it is therefore by the efficacy of this power, of the executive power, and its prudent adjustment that the primitive intention of political society is accomplished. It derives its perfection from its the most exact combination, while all is proportion and everything in equipoise. And I think the term is um, is fundamental here. He's talking about equipoise, b- equilibrium, balance. He's talking about uh, proportions. And he writes in chapter four of the book the following: These they are ties, then not counterpoises. Mm-hmm. Proportions, not distances, fitnesses, not vigilance, which must contribute to the harmony of government. I think this is um, the fundamental insight uh, of Necker, the idea that uh, you uh, need to have uh, a combination, a, a judicious, prudent, harmonious combination and cooperation between these powers if you want to have free and e- efficient government. Otherwise, the powers will fight against each other. And this is actually, in his view, what had happened in the French case. The representatives of the people, the third estate, jealous of the rights of the other uh, orders, the clergy and the nobles, fought against them and then fought against um, the king. And uh, um, in reality, for Necker, uh, the three orders ought to have cooperated, uh, ought to have uh, made compromises uh, concessions in order to create this um, uh, mixed form of government, as, as it were. So Necker right. writes about the in, intertwining of powers, interlacing of powers. He, he never uses the term separation of powers. Okay, excellent. Um, so in, in the introduction, um, you write, uh, quote, on executive power in great states offers an innovative comparative analysis of three political and constitutional traditions. French, American, and English. Um, so what were Necker's main takeaways from the, those comparisons? Um, this comparative constitutional analysis was also kind of ahead of its time, right? Very much so. And it, it is in this regard that I think Necker was a precursor, and if you wish, a precursor of uh, Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville mm-hmm. visited America in 1831, 1832, and published 
his famous Democracy in America in 1835, the first volume, the second appeared in 1840, Necker writes about the American constitutional tradition and American constitutional system in 1792, so 40 years before Tocqueville, and mm -hmm. this is remarkable. Now, um, Necker doesn't write only about America in this book, in the second part of the book. In the first part, he is uh, very much an admirer of the English constitutional monarchy and the English right. constitutional system, as I said. So he compares the three constitutional traditions, the French, the English, and the American. Now, Necker is not the first one to have admired England and have written about England in France. In this regard, he follows also in the footsteps of um, uh, two major representatives in this tradition, but there were many others, Montesquieu in the spirit of the law and uh, Jean-Louis de Lolme in the Constitution of England published in 1771. Another Swiss thinker, by the way, interestingly, Switzerland and England seem to have liked each other's <laughs> political constitutions. Um, the English constitution was unwritten, of course, and uh, this is uh, um, an interesting detail. Uh, Necker thinks that the tradition of constitution is, is strong in England, in spite of the fact that there is no written constitution. But with regard to the American constitution, um, I think uh, and uh, the, the most innovative aspect of Necker's appreciation, I would say, is his emphasis on federalism. Necker understood uh, very much, um, I think he was right in this regard, that uh, the American experiment was something totally new and it was poised to succeed because it was a federal republic. Um, uh, the question was at the time whether a republican form of government can exist on a large territory? The traditional answer had been no. Uh, Montesquieu himself said in order to self-govern themselves, the people need a small territory. Necker understood, and probably he had read the Federalist Papers by then, but I cannot guarantee that. Necker understood that uh, you can extend the size of the republic, you can create a federal system of government, and then you can have a republican form of government combined with federalism. And he devotes a, a, a chapter in this book uh, analyzing the importance of federalism, and he, um, I think, makes some very interesting um, uh, observations. He also appreciates in America bicameralism, which was also a characteristic of the English system. He thought that the French ought to have adopted bicameralism, not monocameralism, the Constitution of 1791 created a uni, a monocameral assembly, one chamber rather than two, and that was another problem with the Constitution that ought to be added to the shortcomings. And uh, Necker um, liked the, the system of um, uh, um, executive veto and the way in which it was practiced in America. It was a suspensive type of veto and, and he uh, argued for uh, a suspensive executive veto to be given to the King of France as well, which the French uh, constitution did have uh, up to a point. So he thought that federalism combined with, mono, uh, with bicameralism and with the uh, executive veto created a system of uh, checks and balances that uh, guaranteed the success of the Republican government in America. We just heard from Aurelian Kreshu, professor of political science at Indiana University Bloomington and editor of On Executive Power in Great States by Jacques Necker. This series is brought to you by the Liberty Fund. Join us next week when we continue our conversation and talk about Necker's historical reception and why his texts never really caught on. Necker suffers from the fatal handicap of moderation. Moderates never uh, occupy the uh, forefront of the political stage. The headlines uh, are never uh, favorable to the moderates. Uh, you have the radicals, the extremists, uh, the most vocal, you know, voices, but um, moderates um, suffer from the fatal handicap of self-restraint, of prudence, and uh, Necker was uh, seen as a, as a vanquished uh, political actor because he withdrew in 1790. He left the political scene and he was seen as, um, as a defeated uh, individual. <laughs>
Um, so those two things, um, I think, contributed to his um, uh, to his image. If you like what you hear, rate us or give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if there's a topic you'd like us to cover, drop me a line. I'm at bmickey at ala-choice.org. As always, sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino. And all of our episodes are produced by Choices Senior Digital Media Producer Mark Dirks and Digital Media Assistant Sabrina Kofer. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. 